Here we have remote test selection and chamber integration. This uses a binary control device or a binary output from the chamber to remotely select tests and start and stop them. Now I have my remote I.O. demonstration board connected so that I can demonstrate these features. We will start in vibration view. And in this case, for my demonstration board, channels 5, 6, 7, and 8 have a binary control device connected to them. And all that does is it has a rotary switch on it where I can select a particular number, in this case 0 through 9. And with that, it will output that binary output to these four channels. Then I have to select a program start, program stop, or program start stop. Program start stop means that when I want to start a test, that high, whatever that start signal is, has to be held. If I release that start signal, the test will stop. I could also do program start which means I just have to momentarily enable that input and the program, whichever I have selected through these 1s, 2s, 4s, and 8s, will be selected. I could also do program stop. So if I wanted to have a program start and program stop button, I could do that. In this case, we'll use program start stop in the first position here. And now I have to put some tests in my remote test selection window. And this is essentially if I had a high input on channel 6 or auxiliary input 6, which is my 2's, so that would be a binary 2 if 1, 4, and 8 were low. It would go to this location, whatever test I select, and start that test. So if I hit Browse, I can find a test profile. I just have a pretty simple sign sweep. And I could also pick another one. Uh, let's just do seven, so we have to have a couple different channels. And we can pick another test, have another random test here. Now I can click Apply. So I have a test on seven and a test on 2. We do have an auxiliary I.O. test panel that can be used. This test panel kind of shows me exactly what is going on right now. Um, if I turn my rotary switch, my binary switch, back to 0, you can see that all four of my inputs are off. If I go to 1, my first, my channel 5, or my input 5 is high. 2, my second is high. 3 is 2 plus 1. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and the last one is 9. So this only has 9 positions. I can go back to 0. Uh, if I wanted to run this test or run, so if I go to 2 and then hold my program start, you can see that my test is selected and it comes up to level. Once it reaches full level and starts running, I could wait for this, or if I wanted to remotely stop my test, I could simply release that hold, and now my test will stop. If I change my binary control device to channel 7 and hit program start, it will open my random test and start running that test.
And again, I can release and the test will stop. You can also use the remote I.O. as an interlock between a chamber and a controller. This is most useful when you're running shake and bake. So I have a chamber on top of my vibration table. When my vibration aborts, I can send an output to the chamber that tells the chamber essentially to bleed to ambient. This prevents a whole bunch of thermal cycling from being done to a product that is not being shook. Uh, the same could be done the other way that if the chamber aborts for any reason, it sends a signal to the controller and tells it to stop or pause the test so that you don't get continued vibe without temperature cycles. Next, we're going to look at some analog inputs. These are in addition to the front analog inputs. Remember, anything that can be converted into a millivolt per engineering unit signal can be connected to the front inputs and measured. Doesn't matter what type of sensor as long as it is scaled appropriately. But there are some reasons to connect to the rear inputs. Uh, if you have something that changes very slowly, uh, these inputs are only sampled at one hertz. But if I have something like in a chamber where I want to measure my current temperature, and have that plotted on a graph in vibration view so I can see where my temperature was when my test might have aborted. What I could do is hook that thermocouple up to a rear input and use that to monitor the temperature of a chamber. You can set a scale. Uh, there are also abort limits that can be applied to that. So if you exceed a certain limit or fall under a certain limit, the test will abort with a stop code that you type in. You can also interlock so that the test will not start unless whatever you're measuring is between two particular parameters. If we take a look at that in vibration view, go again to configuration, remote inputs, Reset all of this. In this case, my analog signal is connected to channel 4. So I can just do user analog. User analog, when I click more, allows me to define my units. On a 0 to 10 volt scale, if we were talking temperature, I could pick temperature. Degree C and say that zero is, eh, we'll just stick with zero, and this is 100. Just making this up as I go. But I can set my abort and interlock limits if I choose to. I can also put in a status bar label. That status bar label, once it is applied, will put a live updating status at the bottom. If I rotate my dial here, you can see that temperature going up and down as I move it. The final option is a stop code. Stop code is used for the abort limits and the interlock limits and I could just say rear temp. This means that if I abort above, let's just do 80, I can click OK. Now once I start running my test, if I exceed 80 degrees, my test will abort. So I do have a graph here. If I do new graph and rear inputs, temperature, I can see that this is in temperature degree C versus time. So this is that rear inputs graph. Now I start my test. And you can see that I'm getting that live 1 hertz sampled time data. If I start adjusting this up, oh, I set my scale too small to abort. And as I scroll down, but I can see those chamber cycles that are occurring and really fast for my 
analog knob that I have, but this is beneficial for tracking things that don't change rapidly during a vibration test. It could be voltage, it could be temperature, it could be pressure, uh, really anything, any analog signal that can be scaled to a millivolt per engineering unit signal on a 0 to 10 volt scale. All right, back to the presentation. Next is the programmable outputs. These are digital outputs that are enabled based on test schedule level. So this could be used to trigger some external device. It could be used to, for a variety of different reasons, start and stop a recorder could be used to start and stop a motor or close a relay while a test is running or in the middle of a sequence. So to do this, I have to first edit my test on the schedule tab. If I click show digital outputs, for each schedule level, I can have different digital outputs enabled or disabled. And as I move through the different levels of my test, these can change. I can have multiples. Uh, all this is doing is once this test level starts, those two particular outputs are going to be enabled. To set this up in the global configuration, go to configuration, remote inputs, and you have the five well, zero through five, so six outputs. Uh, the only more that you can change is whether or not it is negative true logic. Negative true logic, if that were checked, would mean that output zero is held high by default, and when enabled, it is pulled low. Without that checked, it is low by default, default, and Without that checked, it is low by default, and when enabled, goes high. So the last two parts of this are connecting to a relay, again with the digital I.O. This allows you to, in this case, if I enable output 1, my relay would close, which would also close the relay that is to my digital input, which would tell me that my relay is in fact closed. So this is a, relays are a great way to use a low power signal to control something that requires more voltage or more current than what can be for, but than what can be provided through the five volt output on the back of the controller. The last thing I want to talk about is configuring a startup and shutdown sequence. So this uses the digital outputs and what this is is a way to when your test ends shut down maybe your field and armature power and then allow the blower to run for a longer period of time to ensure that it has appropriately cooled before actually turning off the blower. So the way to set this up, uh, there's a shaker power button. So a shaker power output. If I pick, let's say, three of those. So I have three shaker powers. When I click more, I have some options. I can delay X amount of seconds after the amplifier is enabled or after it is shut down. And we'll just do a couple increments here. We'll do five seconds after it is shut down and then 10 and finally 15. So the first thing to shut down could be our armature power by essentially opening that relay. The second thing to shut down could be the field, again by opening a relay. And the third thing would be our blower that we could leave run for an extended period of time and then shut it down.
This checkbox, as soon as you have any shaker power output enabled, this checkbox appears and this is a shutdown sequence. So essentially at the end of a test, in this case it will wait five seconds after the test has ended and then this particular shaker power sequence will start. So I'll wait five seconds and then my output seven will turn off or output six will turn off. Another five seconds, seven, and another five seconds, eight. So if we look at this, I can do view, toolbars, test controls toolbar, and this actually gives me a little shaker button. When I click start and start over, the first thing that happens is my shaker turns on. My test comes up to level. If I stop, you're going to see this after five seconds turn blue. And now it's going to wait that 20 seconds to completely shut down the system. If we actually look at this in system check, I can bring up the Auxio test panel so that we can actually see what is going on here. So now, let's do this and that, and we will loop this on itself. Now, when I hit start, I have to enable my run sequence. My test is going to come up to level. see that happening. As soon as I hit stop, this initial shutdown counter starts and then my five seconds after that, my output six should turn off, five seconds later seven, five seconds later eight. So if I hit stop, you can see one, two, three, four, five, this should turn blue. One, two, three, four, five, this should turn off. One, two, three, four, five, next, and one, two, three, four, five. So that is my shutdown sequence. Obviously, my timing is purely for demonstration, but that gives you the general idea.